Amen. Amen. What an awesome, powerful song. I will build my life upon your love. Well, good morning. Good to see you. Welcome home. We're glad you're here this morning. If you are new today, uh, joining us online, and we haven't already met, my name is Kyle. We're so glad you're here today, and we're just super excited about what God wants to do today. We want to welcome in uh, our Hispanic church. We want to welcome uh, Pitnaz Church, and we want to welcome Connecting Point Church. We're glad that you're here today. Speaking of Connecting Point Church, uh, we love to hear Pastor Sean last week. He did a great job closing out our series uh, on just Jesus. And today we're starting a new series called Cut and Dry Because Some Things Just Are. Cut and Dry Because Some Things Just Are. Say that with me. Cut and Dry Because Some Things Just just are. When you think of the words cut and dry, uh, it simply means that it's already settled. Without question, there's no debate. Some of the kids out there today, you know that your parents are cut and dry on certain things, maybe saying thank you, your curfew, doing your homework. There's certain things that are cut and dry. I was thinking about some things that are cut and dry for us. I remember when our kids were learning to swim, all three of our kids know how to swim now, but when they were learning to swim and, and when they didn't know how to swim, it was cut and, cut and dry, settled without question that they were going to wear a life jacket when we were swimming in a swimming pool. I mean, it's just cut and dry. In fact, even after they learned to swim, uh, we encouraged them and watched them and made sure they wore their life jacket if they were in the pool without us. And the reason why that that was so cut and dry and the reason it's cut and dry for all of us who have kids before they learn to swim and when they're learning to swim is because it's a life and death issue. It's, it's without question because there's too much at stake. We all have different things that are cut and dry for us, but maybe not for others. Like some of us are vegetarians, and so for you, it's cut and dry. You're not going to eat meat. Others of us are, you know, it's cut and dry. You're going to exercise every day. So for some, they don't, but for you, it's cut and dry. And then there's things, like I mentioned earlier with the life jacket, where it's cut and dry for everyone. Another thing that could be cut and dry is speeding in a school zone. Uh, the law tells us that we're not to speed. To, not to speed, and especially not to speed in a school zone. Why? Because it's so important not to hit someone, and we've got kids that are moving around. So cut and dry is extremely important, and the reason things are cut and dry is because of what's at stake. The Lord has some things that are also cut and dry, and over the next six weeks, we're going to be looking and hanging out in a passage of Scripture, if you have your Bibles, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. And in these passages of Scripture, the Lord is cut and dry about some specific things that we're to do and not to do because of what's at stake. So we're going to read those together in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. Here's what the Scripture says. There are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things that he detests. Wait, God hates things? Well, we can love our children, but we can hate their behavior, right? And God loves us, but there are certain things because it means life and death, because it's so important that he hates. And here's what he says those things are. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness that pours out lies, and a person who sows discord in a family. So those things that I just read are where we're going to hang out for the next few weeks, and each week we're going to be looking at a different one of those. But just to recap for just a minute, there are things that the Lord hates. He loves us, but there are certain behaviors that the Lord can't stand. And there's a pattern with them. In fact, if you were to break down that scripture that I just read and reword it in a way that makes sense, maybe for you know, a younger person, maybe a kid, 
here's what, here's what it would mean. Looks, words, thoughts, attitude, and actions that cause other people what, church? That cause other people grief are very upsetting to the Lord. Looks, words, thoughts, attitudes, and actions that cause other people grief are very upsetting to the Lord. So today, we're going to tackle the very first thing that the Lord mentions in Scripture. It's the very first sin that was created, that that came into the world. It's the very first thing on this list, and it's probably the number one thing that that keeps us from having a close relationship with God and prevents us from growing deeper with God, and that's pride. So part one is haughty eyes. And haughty eyes simply means a look of pride, an overestimating of self, and an underestimating of others. In fact, the reason that Jesus has a problem with haughty eyes, which means kind of a a look of pride is because it goes against the very thing that Jesus demonstrated when he came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He he carried his cross. He died a sinner's death. Scripture says in Philippians that he humbled himself even to death. God hates a haughty look because it goes against who God is and what he wants us to be. If you're a business owner, probably the number one thing that you're going to concern yourself with is good customer service. If you're a business owner and you own a restaurant and people are not giving good customer service, they're being rude to to the customers and they're not, you know, caring for people, they have a flippant attitude, you will hate that. You won't hate the person, but you will hate that behavior. God does not like a proud look. Well, Pastor Kyle, why are you using the word hate? Why not dislike? Or he doesn't really, you know, that's not his favorite thing. Or maybe it's, maybe it's God's pet peeve. Well, God doesn't use those words in scripture. He uses the word hate. So when we think of haughty, here's what we're talking about. Someone who is haughty, not haughty, H-O-T-T-Y, someone who's haughty, H-A-U-G-H-T-Y, someone who is haughty is arrogant and full of pride. When you're haughty, you have a big attitude and act like you're better than other people. A haughty person, they act superior and they look down on other people and they're disdainful. They're overbearing, they're prideful, they're swaggering. You hear that word a lot in this culture, he's got swag, or that, you know, they're full of swagger. But, but this definition uses it, swaggering and obnoxious. That's a pretty exhaustive definition of what it means to be a haughty person. And the reality is this morning that there is some different things that can allow us to know if we have a proud or haughty look towards others. And here are some ways we can have a proud or haughty look towards others. First of all, one of the ways that people can have a proud look towards others is intellect. What does that mean? You know that you're smarter than someone else or someone knows they're smarter than you. And because you know you're smarter than them or because they know they're smarter than you, they almost make you feel dumb or you make them feel dumb. Has this ever happened to you before? Someone who's maybe older than you or more well-versed in something and they just have this look about them that says, I'm better than you. God hates that. We don't really preach a lot about looks, not the way that we look necessarily, but we don't preach about the way that our nonverbal communication speaks to other people. Intellect, appearance, we can even get, excuse me, we can even get prideful. We can even get prideful about the way that we look. In fact, scripture tells us 
that one of the reasons that Satan, who used to be an angel, was kicked out of heaven is because he was very attractive and he, and he was proud of his physical appearance. And he also wanted to be like God. And so there was lots of different reasons there, but one of them was his appearance. Some of us can think we're, we look better than someone else and we can look down on people who, who don't have, you know, don't look like we do. Race. I wish that I could say that this wasn't an issue anymore in our culture, but bigotry still exists. We can look at someone who's a different ethnicity than we are, and we can look down on them. God hates that. Our job, we, we, we have this distinguished job, and so we have a look of haughtiness. Kids with sports, sometimes in school, what, what's really most important is how good of an athlete you are. So we only like and hang out with kids who are as good at sports as we are, and we almost make people feel like we're, we're better than them because of that. God hates that. Politics. Politics is another area where we can have a look of pride. Gender. Our job, religion, religion is another one. Maybe you've been going to church your whole life and you don't even realize you're doing it, but you almost have this look of, not of, uh, of proud of the Lord, but just this pride that you've been a Christian a long time. God hates that. The Pharisees had a look of pride. So God hates a proud look but he loves a humble heart. Say that with me. God hates a proud look, but he loves a humble heart. You know, you see, and I won't name names, but there are certain people that won't get into the Hall of Fame because they're too proud to admit they use steroids. And there's some other people who use steroids, but they confessed that and they admitted that and they'll probably get accepted into the Hall of Fame. You see, we have a tendency to honor humility in our culture, and Scripture even talks about that, that we honor humility and that God honors humility. Think about it. That person that admits they messed up, most of the time when someone says they're sorry or they were wrong or they should have done something different, most people, not even Christians, just people in general, usually give grace to people when they are humble and they're willing to, to humble their heart. James says, God opposes the proud, let's finish it together, but gives grace to the humble. So this morning, what you need to know is, is that haughty eyes or a proud look, it has to come from somewhere. There, there has to be an origin. There has to be a genesis. There has to be a reason and haughty eyes, they are the reason, they're the result of a heart that's filled with pride. When you look at someone else that's a different color than you are, or a different gender than you are, or looks at life differently than you do, and you look at them with a proud look, a look of disdain or that you're better than they are. Now listen to this. This is a different kind of a series. It's a different kind of a message. It's not one that, that I've really preached before, but the reality is it's so true and so needed today. When you begin to look at someone differently than, than you're supposed to, it comes with a heart that's filled with pride. Now, I'm not talking about when you look at your child and they need to pick up the room and they're not and you give them a look like you need to get about your business. That's not what this is talking about. It's a look that says, I'm better than you. It's words that say, I'm better than you. It's an attitude or an aura or a demeanor that comes across like you're better. That originates from a heart that's hard. Jesus talked about four different kinds of soil in Scripture. He did a parable on it. He talked about the soil that's hard, which was along the path. And so when it was along the path, um, the seed couldn't go down into the soil, and so the birds would come and snatch it away. He talked about a shallow soil that was full of rocks, and because it was 
full of rocks that couldn't go down deep. And so the sun would hit the seed and scorch it, and it wasn't any good. He talked about a soil that was choked because of the thorns. It wasn't that the seed wasn't there, but because there were so many thorns and, and, and seeds from the thorn plants and those kinds of things, it choked out the good grass and the good seed. And then he talked about a soil that was plowed up, that was a good soil, that grew crops that multiplied. And I'm not really preaching on that whole parable today, or I'd go farther, but I share that little story with you today because it's a lot like our hearts. I guess what I'm asking you today as we get into this is, do you struggle with pride? Do you struggle in some way with being haughty, haughty haughty-eyed, In fact, I would contend today that we all, in some area, struggle with this. There are certain areas within this topic today that I struggle with myself. But really, today, why I'm sharing this story with you about the soil is, the soil kind of represents our hearts. Our hearts can get hard, or they can become shallow, or or the busyness and the things of life can choke out what God's word wants us to do and what God's spirit wants to do in us. Or we can have a heart that's been plowed up by God, that's been plowed up by his Holy Spirit. You see, as believers, where I'm going today with this, with this message, as he talks about haughty eyes being something that he, that he hates, that he detests, As believers, the reason that God hates that attitude, that behavior, never the person, but that behavior, is because it goes against God's kingdom. You see, as believers, we must follow the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to plow up the fields of our hearts daily. Listen to this. As believers, we must allow the Holy Spirit to plow up the fields of our hearts daily. We need to plow up. Say that with me. Plow up. I was thinking about when I was a teenager, uh, we moved to a new home. And my dad always had a vegetable garden when we were growing up. And we decided we're going to do, obviously, another garden. And dad said, get the tiller. tiller. This is the area that I want you to, we're going to put the garden in. Get the tiller, and I want you to till it up. That first round with the tiller, where that dirt had not been, you know, worked over. It was hard and it was callous. Let me tell you, that was the longest trip around the garden was the first one. And it was still hard around the second one and the third, and you get my drift. But the more that it was tilled, the more that it was plowed, it became pliable and ready for seed. When we're born, we have a heart that's untilled, It's unplowed. And part of that hardness is self and pride. You see, pride, it comes from a heart. It comes from a heart that's unplowed by the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 33 says. Plow up, let's read it together. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts. When when someone says they're sorry and we're not willing to say sorry back or I forgive you, depending on what took place, means our heart is hard, means our heart is unplowed. Can I tell you today that without that constant tilling of the Lord in our life and seeking him and, and getting in his word and allowing God to continue to plow up and till our hearts over and over and over, there's a tendency for our hearts to get hard again and to get calloused. Do you have some areas in your life that need tilled up? Here's some signs that your heart needs plowed up. If you seek revenge, your heart needs plowed up. If you have an unforgiving spirit towards someone, your heart needs plowed up. If you're offended easily, 
if you keep record of wrongs, if, if you're impatient, your heart needs plowed up. Here's one. I know no one watching today struggles with this, but some do. If you love drama, in fact, you don't even know what to do without drama, your heart needs plowed up. If you like to stir up dissension, if you don't want to be generous, did you know it does? You don't have, maybe you're not a generous person by nature, but the Holy Spirit is generous. Did you know that? And when the Holy Spirit is inside of our hearts, he gives us the ability to be generous. If you don't have generosity as a part of who you are, your heart needs plowed up. If, you, if you're always focused on yourself instead of others, if you lack self-control, God has some tilling he continues to need to do in your life. As I went through that list, many of us could find something on that list that we struggle with, or at least we have to have God till up over and over and over. I want to give you four things this morning that will enable your life, and more importantly, your heart, to be plowed up and tender so that God can do what he wants to do in you. I was thinking Today, there's a lot of high school football teams who, unless everybody on the team during this epidemic is working out on their own, it's going to be really hard for coaches and, and teams when this thing is over because people maybe haven't been working out. And the reason that coaches want them to work out is so that they're in shape and in the fourth quarter, they're ready to go. And the reason that God wants our heart plowed up is because there's trials and sufferings that work out our lives that, that cause us stress, stress. And if our heart is hard and it's not where it needs to be, then we're going to respond in a way that doesn't represent who Jesus is. So what do we need to do? Number one, we have to give God the plow. Say that with me. Give God the plow. What does that mean? That means we have to come before God every day. And say, God, would you plow up my heart? Would you show me anything in my life that's not what it needs to be? Can I tell you today? There are times where God will plow my heart really hard. You spoke too hard to your child. You should have been more generous here. You should have been more thoughtful here. I'm going to ask you to do something that doesn't make sense. And so because of that, I need your heart to be tender. Can I tell you today, God can't do what he wants to do in you and through you if your heart is hard. So give God the plow. Do you know, if your heart is tender, there might have been someone in your life that was praying for your heart to be tender. Did you know today that if your heart is hard, your spouse might be begging God to till up or plow up your heart? Can I just share with you today, before I move on, that point that I just told you about giving God the plow would solve so many problems in our life. One of the reasons that we don't want help, we don't, guys usually, some girls too, but guys um, don't like to ask for directions. M many times my wife will say, are we lost? No, no, we're not lost. Well, we could just stop and ask for directions. And I give her that haughty, proud look. I will find it. And it could be solved a lot easier if we would just simply, in that case, give my wife the plow and say, I'm lost. I'll stop. I admit it. Some of us just need to give God the plow. But there's also a few, couple other things that, he, that we need to do. We also have to allow him access to all the fields of your heart. 
a farmer doesn't just usually have one piece of land if they're you know if they're farming a lot of crops they usually have several pieces of land it's hard sometimes for all the land to be adjacent in fact a family member of mine has several different pieces of land and you have to drive to those pieces and each one of those pieces of land has to be worked and if it was farmland it would have to be plowed maybe forgiveness is a field that you don't need plowed that much. Whether you're a Christian or not, maybe you just forgive easily. But maybe lust is a field that you need plowed. So somebody who struggles with lust, maybe they don't need the plow, the field of, of uh, forgiveness because they give, they forgive easily. That, that field's plowed up really well, but over here they struggle with purity and that piece of their heart is not surrendered to God. It's not being plowed up because the person who's struggling with lust, they're the plower. They do the plowing. Or maybe you're someone who the field of finances, you've given over to God. You don't have credit card debt. Your heart, your heart is plowed up when it comes to tithe. You don't have to worry about that. You know to tithe. You have faithfully tithed every week since we haven't been meeting, and we appreciate that. But maybe this field over here of religious and maybe this field of you're really, really proud that you give, not in a, not in a maybe a sanctified or saved just proud, but in a proud that's out of control where you look down on people. Maybe that's a field that God needs to plow. See, I guess what I'm saying this morning is when we allow God access to our lives, we're allowing him access to all the fields. Say it with me. All the fields. And I would just about bet you today that there is a field, I don't care who's watching. Maybe it's vanity. Maybe you're concerned about the way that you look to the point that you obsess over it. Maybe it's anxiety, it's fear. There's an area in your life that's not under God's control and it's a field that you have not allowed the Holy Spirit to till up, to plow up, or, or you've done a couple of rounds, right? You've allowed God to go around a couple of times, but you quit because it's the, you know, the dirt's not done yet. And so as a result, you just think this isn't working. God needs access to all the fields of your heart. And not only do you have to give him access, you got to let God plow away every day. Say that with me. Let God plow away every day. I've got a couple of photos for you here that you see on your screen. There's a, a picture of a tractor and there's a plow on the back of it. It's plowing up the dirt. I want you to pay attention to the dirt specifically, if you can see that image from your home. You can see that compared to the other land there in the picture, it's more plowed up than, than the other land. <coughs> Excuse me. It's more plowed up than the other land. But you still really wouldn't plant crops in that dirt, even though it's starting to be tilled up. It's making progress, but it's not tilled up. I think of kids that go to camp. They come to camp what, like the, the, the land there at the top of the picture. Maybe they don't know the Lord and they come to camp or, and there's, their hearts are totally not tilled up by the Lord. And then they allow, they hear the message and they allow the Lord to start tilling their heart and he does some work. But when they go home, they don't allow the Lord to continue to till up their heart. And then they get frustrated when the seeds don't take root. And then I want to show you another image. This is an image, as you can see, where the dirt has been tilled up over and over and over and over and over it's good soil. Jesus talks about that good soil and that last soil that I talked about. And listen to what he says. The son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world. And the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The 
God's desire for your life is that your heart would look like this dirt, dirt that's been tilled up, dirt that's been readied and prepared to receive the seed. And as you continue to allow God to work in your heart, it begins to plant. It begins to grow in you. I got to thinking about that, though. Sometimes we, we have a tendency to let God start something in us where he tills up the dirt, but we don't let him finish it. God wants to finish what he started in you. We have to give him access to the fields, and we have to let God decide what gets planted and what gets pulled. See, there's certain seeds that God wants to plant in you, like humility, not pride, like a tender heart, not a hard heart. And the reason for that is not just for that. It's so that something will grow in you. So instead of pride growing in you, humility will grow in you. Instead of selfishness growing in you, selflessness will grow in you. And for that to happen... God gets to decide what the seed is, and God gets to decide what gets pulled out. If you're walking with God, you know that the Holy Spirit every once in a while will say, don't don't say that. Don't do that. He's pulling that out. Don't, Don't do that. Sometimes God can begin to work in our hearts and in our lives. And we start to see some, some harvest. But we also have to remember that God hates it when we think our field is better than someone else's field. That's what keeps us from reaching out to people is when we have this look of disdain. We have to realize that when you start comparing your field to someone else's field, it's time for God to do some more plowing in your field. Come on. When you start comparing your field to someone else's field, it's time for God to do some more plowing in your field. Now, here's what I mean by that. Some of us who struggle not with, not with being arrogant, we struggle with, we say it's humility, but really it's we don't believe who God says we are. And because we don't believe who God says we are, we look at other people's field and say, I wish I was like them. Then there's some of us who struggle not with that. We struggle with thinking our field's better. And so God needs to plow up our heart and realize that we're no better and we're no worse. Seven things that God, seven behaviors that God doesn't like, that he hates. The first one is a haughty look. God hates a proud look, but he loves a humble heart. So here's my question today. Have you given God permission to plow all the fields of your heart? Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 4 that we're to guard our heart above all else for it determines the course of our life. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. And he's telling us that the epitome of wisdom comes from Solomon. I mean, God gave him beyond wisdom. Solomon is saying, more than anything else, make sure that your heart is tender. Because if your heart is hard, it's going to determine the course of your life. If your heart is tender, it's going to determine the course of your life. The condition, the pliability of your heart is everything. Not just for salvation, which is the most important thing, but also for the ministry that God wants to use you for, for the, the fruits of the Spirit to be displayed in your life. So how do we guard our hearts? How, how do we guard our hearts when we're seeking a spouse? You know, How do we guard our hearts when, when someone's being cruel to us? How do we guard our hearts when we're tempted? How do we guard our hearts when someone says something mean to us? 
and hateful to us? How do we guard our hearts when we're, when we're full of anxiety? How do we guard our hearts in the middle of the coronavirus when we can't see anybody that we want to see and we can't hug people we want to hug and it feels like that this is a never-ending thing that's going on? David says the way that you guard your hearts is to simply pray this prayer, search me, O God, and know my heart. Search for weeds and pull them out. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So church, as you look at that scripture, do you see anything about that scripture that would indicate a hard heart? What, what I see when I look at that scripture is not a hard heart, but a heart that is surrendered to God that is simply saying, listen, if there's anything in my life, any pride, any proud look, any arrogance, anything in me that's offensive to you, God, please let me know so that I can deal with it. I remember when I was a kid, I hated this. My dad would do it every year. First day of school, when we would get dropped off with the teacher, my dad would look at the teacher and say, I want to know if you have any trouble with my child, you let me know, and it won't be a problem anymore. What he's saying is, I care so much about my son and how he turns out that if he starts to go the wrong direction or make a wrong decision, I want to know so that I can talk it through with him. Can I tell you today? If our desire is to follow God, if our desire, maybe your desire isn't that today, but if your desire today is to follow God and to be what God wants you to be through anxiety, through depression, through finances, through through trials, the way you handle enemies, the way you deal with things, if that's your desire, then you have to allow God permission to plow up the field of your heart. And a simple way you do that is to pray this prayer every single day, maybe more than once. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. What's the area, what's the field in your life that you know, if you were honest, God needs to go around that and plow that a little bit more. What if today you said, God, take another lap with the plow, take another lap with the tiller? What's the area? Kids, teenagers, you've been on your phone a lot. Is there any areas in your life with your phone that you need to surrender over to God? Is there anything in your life There's nothing more important than a heart that is tender and pliable before before God, before God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we thank you today for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you created us and that you care about us so much and you care about us becoming what you've created us to be that certain things are cut and dry. Father, thank you that you, you died so that we didn't have to have a proud heart or a proud look, but rather we could have a humble heart and a heart that's dedicated and surrendered to you. And Lord, I pray for that person today that there's an area in their life, God, that they have not given to you. There's a field or fields of their heart that have not been given to you. Maybe there's a a field of pain. Lord, someone in their life has died or someone in their life said something or did something and they've been holding on to it for a long time. There's a field of addiction in their heart. Father, would you, would they allow you, Lord, to just plow that up? Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you love us enough to discipline us. Thank you that you love us enough to teach us. I think, Lord, as a parent, that not every conversation with my kids 
his warm fuzzies. Sometimes as a parent, Lord, you, you call us as parents to have hard conversations. We don't like to view discipline as love, but it's love. Father, today, may we not see your word as do's and don'ts, but may we see it that you love us so much that you care about our behavior towards you and towards others. Lord Jesus, if there's anything in our life you need to plow up, tell us, remind us, give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen.